excuse me, little dog. <coughs> Hi, guys. It is a spectacularly gorgeous October night in August. Here, it is a just unbelievably beautiful. Uh, where are we? We are Wednesday night, August 2nd, 2023. The super moon will be rising shortly. It is a fine night here in the collapse of global industrial civilization and all the rest of it. The little dog and I have been out building uh, trails through bugs in a jar farm and uh, <laughs> So this is his new necktie, so I can see him running off through the mountains, chasing the critters here. So anyway, I am just now putting on, literally putting on my Doomer hat. I'm going from Planet Nibbler Airbnb Super Host to the Chronicler of Global Industrial Civilization here on this gorgeous summer night. And uh, I want to thank Alert Tribes member John, John Elliott, my old buddy who I traveled to Mexico with, has found me an article in this uh, outfit called simply The Ecologist, written by an economist. I don't know anything about this fellow, uh, he, he describes himself as an economist uh, named James Meadway, M-E-A-D-W-A-Y. James Meadway, an economist with a brain writing for the ecologist, and he is going to explain to anyone who doesn't normally listen to economists, which includes me, of course. He is going to explain the economics of systems collapse. And this is his reading of this. I have already uh, done a, uh, a couple of rants springing from this article in the journal Nature Sustainability from June 22nd. And this is an economist spin on that article about basically about how the, the planet is collapsing a lot sooner than previously thought. So we will see what this economist thinks about, about this. <clears throat> Take it away, James. Economists in the mainstream have not even begun to understand the implications of ecological systems collapse. We may be seriously underestimating the possibility of ecosystem collapse over the next few decades, according to some new research published recently in the scientific journal Nature Sustainability. So he has a link to that article if you have, <clears throat> as I say, I've already gone over this article, but if you haven't read it, <coughs> you can find all the, the, you know, the original research in this link to that story um, where you can read the paper itself in Nature Sustainability, but we're going to let James give an economist with a brain uh, his reading of the story. Okay, so this is a little bit Collapse 101 starting here, particularly in the beginning. You know, you know I'm always running into this about when, when I find articles that to me and anyone who's been in the Doomosphere for over 15 minutes saying, no shit, Sherlock, but then I got to remember, guys, that maybe once a year we actually have somebody new coming into the Doomosphere trying to figure out what we are talking about. So uh, we're going to let an economist 
give it like a kindergarten lesson to ecological collapse. <clears throat> Oops. I gotta find the top of this. Okay. The world's ecosystems are already changing rapidly. Rainforests are being turned into savanna. Savanna is turning into desert. Tundra is thawing out. And, of course, the polar ice caps are melting. What the research indicates using computer models of global and some major regional ecosystems is that this combination of multiple existing ecological stresses are all working together to make the collapse of ecosystems far more likely, and it dates much closer to us than has been previously predicted. It's the combination of factors that make the difference. We often reduce the ecological crisis to only climate change, but the threat to systems is also coming from damaging biodiversity losses, resource overuse, and all the other anthropogenic pollutants. Now, I don't know if James uh, has figured out whether maybe 8 billion humans are the problem behind it all. But we'll let James figure that out on his own time. Uh, once these additional factors are accounted for, you know, outside of climate change, the ecosystem models go haywire. Systems that were previously expected to collapse in the 2090s from one single factor like rising temperatures will, in the worst case scenario, fall apart as early as the 2030s. This is the importance of taking a holistic view of these changes understanding each of these stresses together rather than as individual issues. As the authors of the new report say, these collapses are essentially irreversible events, pushing an ecosystem beyond the tipping point is not something that can be patched up. Once it's gone, it's gone. And once you have multiple collapses happening, the interactions between them also start to pull the wider system in, into chaos. This will be a point of no return for the planet and for all of us who have to live here an irreversible breach in human and natural history. If all of this wasn't pleasant enough, there is a growing case for saying some of these tipping points have already been breached. We have already passed into a new period in the Earth's history as a result of human activity which geologists refer to as the Anthropocene. Rapid climate change is just the best known element in this new geological period, but massive biodiversity loss in what is likely to be the world's sixth known mass extinction event is a major element. Worsening chaos and, insta and instability are not some passing crisis, but a fundamental reality for all of us from this point forward. It's an extremely bleak picture, but it's not one that conventional economic thinking takes much account of. Do you think so? 
or even is able to take much account of the conventional economic models of climate change, the integrated assessment models are built around the fundamental idea that everything is reversible in some sense, or at the very least, some sum of money could be paid to compensate for a loss. That is combined with a doctrinal belief in the power of technological progress. The process of invention and technological change will eventually come up with radically better ways of securing economic growth. You can see this most obviously in the main IPCC forecasting models for net zero, which includes an, an incredibly efficient negative emissions technology that can magically remove carbon from the atmosphere. Such a technology or technologies does not yet exist. Dealing with climate change in this worldview, in the worldview of mainstream economics, becomes an issue of trade-offs. How much expense and growth do we sacrifice to, today given our forecast of damage from climate change tomorrow? kind of reminds me of, you know, the old Popeye cartoons with Wimpy. Uh, I will pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. I always loved Wimpy. You know, it was one of those, those jokes that never, it, it was always the same joke. Week after week, year after year, it was the same joke. And this is what, that this whole thing has become one wimpy joke from a car, from a 1950s cartoon. Uh, I will pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Uh, this is what the economic model that uh, James is talking about. Anyway, getting back to James. <clears throat> But if tipping points are real, and they seem to be, and ecological damage is irreversible, the basis for this form of economic thinking is destroyed. There is no trade-off possible when something has been irreversibly lost. You can't trade off an extinct species or a collapsed ecosystem, they are gone. Instead of thinking about essentially marginal changes to the system, you need to think about big fundamental shifts in how the economy is organized, and not only to reduce future harm as far as possible, to build a world where the very real cost of misery of future ecosystem collapse and ecological instability is fairly managed, protecting people as far as possible. At present, we are short of doing, we, we are sort of doing the first with various agreements on reducing greenhouse gas emissions globally, but we are barely scratching the surface of the second. The real and serious crisis of adaptation is not being mentioned in the mainstream discussions of the economic crisis. To pick just the British example, the Bank of England here, so this guy is from England, the Bank of England here continues to jam up interest rates when confronted with ecological shock inflation, pushing the cost 
onto everyday people instead of facing up to the real issues and the new economic and ecological reality. The British Labour Party is another illustration of the problem. Labour's original plans for ecological investment were for a world of low interest rates and inflation. If they want to get serious about climate change now, they need to talk about redistribution and adaptation. I invite James to uh, read Michael Campy's uh, essay on adaptation level zero yesterday. We need massive investments and substantial tax reform to equip or at least partially insulate our economies from the worst impacts of ecosystem collapse. But as labor seemingly won't do that, they're steadily working their way through abandoning every commitment they have made thus far, big or small, under the auspices of the infamous fiscal rules and are unable to adapt their thinking to these new realities. <clears throat> we are left with institutions that were drawn up in a world where climate change was not a direct and pressing global issue. It was a threat for the future, only making its presence felt at the edges harsh on small island states, but for the developed world, something that could be largely ignored. Now, the ecological collapse is here and getting worse with every passing day. And existing strategies built around state investment and technology-led decarbonization are already under strain. This is a new world. If our institutions don't catch up soon, it will be the rest of us that are left to suffer in permanently higher inflation and the doom loop of higher interest rates as the accompaniment to wider ecological collapse. Prime Minister Keir Starmer, if that's where we're headed, might find he has more than tree huggers to worry about if labor doesn't get its act together. <laughs> there you go. So I'm not uh, quite up on my uh, British politics, but uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, in England, as in the U.S. or anywhere else, anybody thinking that any political system is, is going to change the, uh, the, you know, the downward spiral of this planet. Uh, <laughs> Paul Lee's uh, so apparently James is still thinking that there's some difference in political parties in, uh, in England. It makes no difference what political party is in power. The, these famous Greens uh, will never get in power. And if the Greens ever were to get in, in, in power, which is like Sancho Panza, you know, beating a pit bull's ass, it ain't going to happen. But even if it did happen, uh, they would start compromising with the global corporatocracy uh, to survive. Uh, they they would put up all of these these, these uh, noble sounding smoke screens and whatnot, and they, you know and bless their little green hearts, but it it, it ain't gonna happen. Uh, 
it is what it is. This has nothing to do with politics. And in a few more years, it has nothing to do with economics. Uh, it's all coming down together. The economic collapse, the social collapse, and of course, as this economist states, the ecological collapse is already here, and it is getting worse every day, which is why I am sitting out here with my little dog on this gorgeous, soon-to-be 45-degree August night, uh, waiting for the supermoon to rise, enjoying a margarita while I still can, and I highly suggest you get out there and do whatever you can to enjoy it. Well, I'm off to refresh my drink. Get ready for another cold night in the summer of 2023. My guys. This little dog, you look like you're already crashed out for the night. Looks like we have lost Sancho Banza. Oh, man. <laughs> I tell you, this, this flower box... <laughs> I, I, I like I like how can this thing get any more outrageous with each passing day? Bye guys.